All right, greetings and salutations. My name is Comic Fire, and welcome to the dramatic reading of the Edge Chronicles, Book Two, Storm Chaser. This will be handled in a clearly different way than the first dramatic reading was handled. So, let's skip the preamble and just get on to the story. The Edge Chronicles, Storm Chaser. Introduction. Far, far away, jutting out into the emptiness beyond like the figurehead of a mighty stone ship, is the edge. A broad, swollen river, the edge water, pours endlessly over the lip of rock at its overhanging point and down into the void below. Its source lies far inland, high up in the dark and perilous deep woods. On the fringes of this great forest where the clouds descend lie the Edgelands, a barren wasteland of swirling mists, spirits, and nightmares. Those who lose themselves in the Edgelands face one of two possible fates. The lucky ones will stumble blindly to the cliff edge and plunge to their deaths. The unlucky ones will find themselves in the twilight woods. Bathed in their never-ending golden half-light, the twilight woods are enchanting, but also treacherous. The atmosphere there is intoxicating. Those who breathe it for too long can forget the reason they ever came, like the lost knights on long-forgotten quests who would give up on life, if only life would give up on them. On occasions the heavy stillness of the twilight woods is disturbed by violent storms which blow in from beyond the edge. Drawn there like moths to a flame, the storms circle the glowing sky, sometimes for days at a time. Some of the storms are special. The lightning bolts they release create storm fracks, a substance so valuable that, despite the dangers of the twilight woods, it acts like a magnet to those who would possess it. At its lower reaches, the twilight woods give way to the mire. It is a stinking, polluted place, rank with the slurry from the factories and foundries of Undertown, which have pumped and dumped their waste for so long that the land is dead. And yet, like everywhere else on the edge, there are those who live here. Pink-eyed and bleached as white as their surroundings, they are the rummagers, the scavengers. Those who manage to make their way across the mire find themselves in a warren of ramshackle hovels and run-down slums which straddle the oozing Edgewater River, this is Undertown. Its population is made up of all the strange peoples, creatures, and tribes of the Edge crammed into its narrow alleys. It is dirty, overcrowded, and often violent. Yet Undertown is also the center of all economic activity, both above board and underhand. It buzzes, it bustles, it bristles with energy. Everyone who lives there has a particular trade, with its attendant league and clearly defined district. This leads to intrigue, plotting, bitter competition, and perpetual disputes. District with district, league with league, tradesmen with rival tradesmen. The only matter which unites all leaguesmen is their shared fear and hatred of the sky pirates who dominate the skies above the edge in their independent boats and prey off any hapless leaguemen whose paths they cross. At the center of Undertown is a great iron ring, to which a long and heavy chain now tout, now slack, extends up into the sky. At its end is a great floating rock. Like all other buoyant rocks of the edge, it started out in the stone gardens, poking up out of the ground, growing, being pushed up further by new rocks growing beneath it, and becoming bigger still. The chain was attached when the rock became large and light enough to float up into the sky. Upon it, the magnificent city of Sanctifrax had been constructed. Sanctifrax, with its tall, thin towers connected by viaducts and walkways, the seat of learning. It is peopled with academics, alchemists, and apprentices. Everyone has a title. And furnished with libraries, laboratories, and lecture halls, refectories, and common rooms. The subjects studied there are as obscure as they are jealously guarded, and despite the apparent air of fusty, bookish benevolence, Sanctifrax is a seething cauldron of rivalries, 
plots and counterplots and bitter faction fighting. The deep woods, the edgelands, the twilight woods, the mire and the stone gardens, Undertown and Sanctifrax, the river Edgewater, names on a map. Yet behind each name lie a thousand tales, tales that have been recorded in ancient scrolls, tales that have been passed down the generations by word of mouth, tales which even now are being told. What follows is but one of those tales. Chapter 1. Reunion It was midday and Undertown was bustling. Beneath the pall of filthy mist which hovered over the town, fuzzing the rooftops and dissolving the sun, its narrow streets and alleyways were alive with feverish activity. There was ill-tempered haggling and bartering. Buskers played music, borrow boys called out on miserable bargains. Beggars made their pitiful demands from dark, shadowy corners, though there were few that paused to place the coins in their hats. Rushing this way and that, everyone was far too wrapped up in their own concerns to spare a thought for anyone else. Getting from A to B as quickly as possible, being the first to nail a deal, obtaining the best price while undercutting your competitors, that was what succeeding in Undertown was all about. You needed nerves of steel and eyes in the back of your head to survive. You had to learn to smile even as you were stabbing someone in the back. It was a rough life, a tough life. A ruthless life. It was an exhilarating life. Twig hurried up from the boom docks and through the marketplace, not because he was in any particular hurry himself, but because the frenzy's atmosphere was contagious. Anyway, he had learned the hard way that those who don't adjust to the breakneck pace of the place were liable to get knocked down and trampled underfoot. Along with avoid all eye contact and do not display weakness, Go with the flow was one of the cardinal rules of Undertown. Twig was feeling uncomfortably hot. The sun was at its zenith. Despite it being obscured by the choking, foul-tasting smoke from the metal foundries, it beat down ferociously. There was no wind, and as Twig dodged his way past the shop stands and stalls, a bewildering mix of smells assaulted his nostrils. Stale wood ale, ripe cheeses, burned milk and boiling glue roasting pine coffee and sizzling tilder sausages. The spicy aroma of the sausages took Twig back, as it always did, back to his childhood. Every Wadgis night in the Wood Troll village where he had been brought up, the adults would feast on the traditional tilder sausage soup. How long ago that now seemed, and how far away! Life then had been so different, self-contained, ordered, unhurried. Twig smiled to himself. He could never return to that life. (laughs) Not now. Not for all the trees in the deep woods. As he continued across the marketplace, the mouth-watering aroma of the sausages grew fainter and was replaced with a different smell. A smell which triggered a different set of memories altogether. It was the unmistakable scent of freshly tanned leather. Twig stopped and looked round. A tall individual with blood-red skin and crimson hair of a slaughterer was standing by a wall. Hanging round his neck was a wooden tray overflowing with the leather talismans and amulets on thongs which he was selling. Or rather, trying to sell. Lucky charms, he cried. Get your lucky charms, eh? No one was paying him any heed. And when he went to tie the charms around the necks of the passers-by, each attempt was greeted with an irritated shake of the head as the goblin or troll or whatever hurried past. Twig watched him sadly. The slaughterer, like so many of the Deepwoods folk who had listened to the rumors that the streets of Undertown were paved with gold, was finding the reality quite different. With a sigh, he turned and was about to move on when, at that moment, a particularly mean-looking clotter trog in tattered clothes and heavy boots brushed past him. Lucky charm, the slaughterer said cheerily and stepped forwards, leather hong at the ready. Keep your murderous red hands off me, the clotter shrug roared and shoved the outstretched arm savagely away. The slaughterer spun round and crashed to the ground. The lucky charms went everywhere. As the clotter shrug stomped off, cursing under his breath, Twig hurried over to the slaughterer. Are you all right? he asked, reaching down to help him to his feet. The slaughterer rolled over and blinked up at him. Bloomin' rudeness, he complained. I don't know. 
He looked away and began gathering up the charms and returning them to the tray. All I'm trying to do is scratch an honest living. It can't be easy, said Twig sympathetically. So far away from your deep woods home. Twig knew the slaughterers well. He'd once stayed with them in their forest village, and to this day, he still wore the hamelhorn skin waistcoat they'd given him. The slaughterer looked up. Twig touched his forehead in greeting and reached down with his hand once again. This time, with the last of the charms back in place, the slaughterer took a hold and pulled himself up. He touched his own forehead. "'I am tendin,' he said, "'and thank you for stopping to see whether I was all right. Most folk around here wouldn't give you the time of day.' He sniffed. "'I don't suppose,' he checked himself. "'What?' said Twig. The slaughterer shrugged. "'I was just wondering whether you might care to buy one of my lucky charms.' And Twig smiled to himself as, unbidden, the slaughterer selected one of the leather talismans and held it out. "'How about this one? It's extremely potent.' Twig looked at the intricate spiral tooled into the deep red leather. He knew that, for the slaughterers, the individual designs on the charm each had its own significance. "'Those who wear this charm,' the slaughterer went on as he tied the thong around Twig's neck, "'shall be freed from fear of the known.' "'Shouldn't that be unknown?' said Twig. The slaughterer snorted. "'Fear of the unknown is for the foolish and weak,' he said. "'I had not taken you for such a one.' "'No,' he added. "'For my money, what is known is generally far more frightening. "'And speaking of money, that'll be six quarters.' Twig reached into his pockets. "'Unless,' the slaughterer added in a conspiratorial whisper, "'you've got any frax dust.' He looked at the silver ball-shaped medallion hanging round Twig's neck. A speck would do. Sorry, said Twig, dropping coins into the waiting blood-red palm. I have none to spare. The slaughterer shrugged with resignation. Just a thought, he muttered. With the latest charm nestling amongst the others he'd accumulated over the years, Twig continued on his way through the labyrinth of tiny, winding alleyways. He was passing a pet shop heavy with the odor of damp straw and hot fur, when all at once a small, vicious-looking creature rushed up towards him, teeth bared. Twig started back nervously, then laughed as it reached the end of its leash and began leaping up and down on the spot, grunting excitedly. It was a Prowlgrin cub, and it wanted to play. "'Hello, boy,' he said, crouching down and rubbing the frolicsome creature beneath its hairy chin. The Prowlgrin gurgled with pleasure and rolled over onto its back. You big softy, said Twig. He knew it wouldn't last. Fully grown Prelgrins were both beasts of burden and favored guard beasts of those with anything worth guarding. Aye, came a rasping yet insistent whisper. What are you wasting your time with that bag of leech fleas for? Come over here. Twig looked round. Besides the Prelgrin, the front of the ramshackle shop had countless other creatures on display. Furry, feathered, and scaled, as well as some of the lesser trolls and goblins which were chained to the walls. There wasn't one of them that looked as though it had spoken. "'I'll pay a Twig,' the voice came again, more urgently now. A shiver ran up and down Twig's spine. Whatever had spoken also knew him. "'Over here!' Twig looked up and gasped. "'Caterbird!' he said. "'The very same.' The caterbird whispered and shifted round awkwardly on its perch to face him. Greetings. Greetings, said Twig. But keep your voice down. The caterbird hissed and its right eye swiveled round to the entrance of the shop. I don't want flab sweat to know I can talk. Twig nodded and swallowed away the lump in his throat. How had so noble a creature ended up in such squalid surroundings? The caterbird that had watched over Twig ever since it had been present in his hatching. Who had dared to capture it? And why had it been placed in a cage barely larger than the poor creature itself, so that it had to squat down on its perch with its magnificent horned beak sticking out through the bars, unable to straighten up, unable to flap its wings? I'll soon have you out of there, said Twig, pulling the knife from his belt. He thrust the thin blade into the keyhole of the padlock and began jiggling it around feverishly. Hurry, urged the caterbird. And for sky's sake, don't let Flab Sweat see what you're up to. Any second now, Twig muttered through clenched teeth, but the padlock remained stubbornly locked. If I can just... 
At that moment, the air suddenly resounded with a deafening crack. Twig immediately stopped what he was doing and spun round in alarm. He knew what had happened. It happened all the time. The emergency chains which had helped to hold the floating city of Sanctifrax in place were always breaking. Another one's gone! Someone screamed. Look out! Screeched another. But it was already too late. The chain which had snapped was already tumbling back to earth with an incongruously gentle jingle jangle. Down on the street, everyone was dashing this way and that, bumping into one another, getting nowhere. The chain crashed down. A scream went up, and then silence. As the dust settled, Twig surveyed the scene. The roof of the ironmonger's opposite had been stoved in. Two stalls were flattened. And there on the street lay an unfortunate creature, crushed to death by the weight of the falling metal. Twig stared at the tattered clothes and familiar heavy boots. It was the Clodder Trog. Perhaps you should have thought to listen to the slaughterer after all, he thought, and fingered the amulet around his neck. Now it was too late. For the Clodder Trog, luck had run out. Oh, May, he heard the caterbird sigh. The situation is reaching crisis point, and that's a fact. What do you mean? Twig asked. It's a long story, he said slowly. And... He paused. What? said Twig. The caterbird remained silent. It swiveled one eye meaningly round towards the entrance of the shop. Oi! came a gruff voice. Are you intending to buy that bird or what? Sliding the knife up his sleeve as he did so, Twig turned. He was confronted by a heavy-set character who was standing with his legs apart and hands on his hips. I, I just started in here with a chain broke, he said. Hmm, said Flab Sweat, looking round at the damage that had been caused. A bad business it is, all this chain breaking. And for all that bunch of so called academics, what good do they ever do us, parasites, the lot of them? You know what? If it was up to me, I'd cut all the chains and let Sanctifrax fly off into open sky. And good riddance, he added bitterly, as he patted his glistening head with a dirty handkerchief. Twig was speechless. He'd never heard anyone talk ill of the academics of the floating city before. Still, Flab Sweat went on, at least none of my property's been damaged, eh? This time. Now, are you interested in that bird or not? He asked Weasley. Twig glanced back at the bedraggled caterbird. I was hoping for a talker. Flab Sweat chuckled mirthlessly. Oh, you'll get nothing out of that one, he said scornfully. Thick it is. Still, you're welcome to try. Could let you have it for a very reasonable price. He turned abruptly. I'm with another customer at the moment, he called back. Give me a shout if you need any help. Thick indeed, that caterbird exclaimed when Flab Sweat had gone. The cheek, the audacity. Its eyes swiveled round and focused on Twig. Well, don't just stand there smirking, it snapped. Get me out of here while the coast is clear. No, said Twig. The caterbird stared back at him nonplussed and cocked its head to one side as far as the cage would allow. No, it said. No, Twig repeated. I want to hear that long story first. The situation is reaching crisis point. That's what you said. I want to know why. I want to know what's happened. Let me out and then I'll tell you everything, said the caterbird. No, said Twig for a third time. I know you. You'll fly off the moment I unlock the cage door, and then I won't see you again till Sky knows when. Tell me the story first and then I'll set you free. Why, you insolent young whelp! The caterbird shouted angrily. That's after everything I've done for you! Keep your voice down, said Twig, looking round nervously at the door. Flab Sweat will hear you. The caterbird fell still. It closed its eyes. For a moment, Twig thought it was going to remain stubbornly silent. He was on the point of relenting when the caterbird's beak moved. It all began a long time ago, it began. Twenty years, to be precise, when your father was little older than you are now. But that was before you were even born, said Twig. Caterbird share dreams, you know that, it replied. What one knows, we all know. And if you're gonna interrupt the whole time... I'm not, said Twig. Sorry, won't do it again. The caterbird humped irritably. Just say that you don't. Chapter 2, The Caterbird's Tale Picture the scene, the caterbird said. 
a cold, blustery, yet clear evening. The moon rises over Sanctifrax, its towers and spires silhouetted against the purple sky. A lone figure emerges from the bottom of a particularly ill-favoured tower and scurries across the cobbled courtyard. It's an apprentice rain taster. His name is Vilnix Pomponius. What, THE Vilnix Pomponius? Twig blurted out. Most high academe of Sanctifrax. Although he had never seen the lofty academic, his reputation went before him. Aye, the very same, said the caterbird. Many of those who attain greatness have the humblest of origins. In fact, he used to be a knife grinder down in Undertone. But Vilnix Pomponius was always ruthlessly ambitious, and never more so than on that night. As he hurried on, head down into the wind, towards the glittering spires of the school of light and darkness, he was plotting and scheming. Twig shuddered, and the fur of his hamelhorn skin waistcoat bristled ominously. For you see, the caterbird explained, Vilnix had the air, and an indulgent ear, what's more, of one of the most powerful Sanctifrax scholars at the time, the Professor of Darkness. It was he who sponsored Vilnix through the Knight's Academy, and when Vilnix was later dismissed for insubordination, it was he who secured his place in the faculty of rain tasters, rather than see him cast out of Sanctifrax completely. The caterbirds took a breath, then continued. Once inside the opulence of the professor's study, Vilnix held up a glass beaker of liquid dramatically. The rain coming in from over the edge is becoming more acidic, he said. This is due to an increase in the number of sour mist particles in the raindrops. It was thought you might be interested, he added slyly. The professor of darkness was interested. Very interested. The presence of sour mist particles could presage the arrival of a great storm. I must consult with the wind touchers and cloud watchers, he said, to determine whether they have also identified signs of an approaching great storm. Good work, my boy. Vilnix's eyes gleamed and his heart missed a beat. Things were going better than he'd hoped. Taking care not to arouse his suspicions, he drew the old professor on. A great storm, he said innocently. Does this mean a night academic will be sent in search of more storm fracks? The professor confirmed that it did. He tapped the papers in front of him. And not before time, either, if these figures are correct, he said. The great rock which Sanctifrax stands upon is still growing, larger and larger, more and more buoyant. His voice trailed away and he shook his head in despair. Vilnix watched him out of the corner of his eye. And you need more storm frags in the treasury to weigh it down, to... to... The professor nodded vigorously. To preserve the equilibrium, he said and sighed. It is so long since a night academic returned with fresh supplies of storm frags. A smile played over Vilnix's curled lips. And which night is to be sent on this occasion, he asked. The professor snorted. The Professor of Light's protege. Quintinius, he frowned. Quintinius, so oh, what's his name? Vilnix winced. Quintinius Virginix, he said. My father, Twig exclaimed, unable to keep quiet a moment longer. I didn't realize that he knew the Most High Academe, nor that he was ever in the Knight's Academy, he paused thoughtfully. But then there's much I don't know about his life before he became a sp sky pirate anyway, he added. If you just hold your tongue for a moment, the caterbird said impatiently, then perhaps... It was cut short by the sound of frantic yelping which came from inside the shop. The next moment Flab Sweat appeared at the doorway, white as a sheet and babbling on about how a vulpoon, a straggly bird of prey with a viciously serrated beak and razor-sharp talons, had just slipped its tether and laid into a hapless lap muffler. Is it all right? asked Twig. All right, Flab Sweat wheezed. The lap muffler? No, it's not all right. Guts everywhere there are. And you can get good money for a lap muffler. I'll have to fetch the animal quack, he muttered, and get it stitched up again. He looked at Twig as if seeing him for the first time. Are you trustworthy? he asked. Twig nodded. <sighs> Flab Sweat mumbled. Well, since you're here, would you mind watching the shop while I'm gone? That could be something in it for you. That's fine, said Twig, trying not to sound too eager. The moment Flab Sweat was out of earshot, the caterbird immediately asked once more to be set free. But Twig was adamant. 
all in good time, he said. After all, there's nothing worse than a tale which ends halfway through its telling. The caterbird grumbled under its breath. Where was I, then? Oh, yes, Vilnix and your father. The pair of them entered the Knight's Academy on the very same morning, and yet, from that very first day, Quintinius Virginix outshone all the other young hopefuls, Vilnix included. In swordplay, archery, and unarmed combat, he was unmatched. In sailing of the storm chasers, the sky ships especially designed to chase great storms, he was peerless. Twig beamed proudly, and imagined himself chasing a great storm. Pitching and rolling as the ship locked onto the whirling wind, then breaking through to the stillness within. Pay attention, hissed the caterbird. Twig looked up guiltily. I am, he protested. Ugh, said the caterbird dubiously, its neck feathers rumbling. As I was saying, the professor explained to Vilnix, if the great storm was confirmed, then, as tradition demanded, Quintinius Virginix would be knighted and dispatched to the Twilight Woods. Sky willing he'd return with Stormfrix. Vilnix smiled that smile of his inscrutable reptilian. Now at last, the time had come to touch upon the subject he'd wanted to inquire about all along. This Stormfrax, he said, in as offhand a manner as he could manage. When I was in the Knight's Academy, it was often talked about as the most wonderful substance that ever existed. We were told the shards of Stormfrax are in fact pure lightning, he continued, his voice oily, treacherous. Can this possibly be true? The Professor of Darkness nodded solemnly, and when he spoke again, it was as though he was reciting from an ancient text. That which is called Stormfrax, he proclaimed, is created in the eye of a great storm, a mighty maelstrom which is formed far beyond the edge once every several years, which blows in on parched and sulfurous winds, which howls and sparks as it crosses the sky towards the twilight woods. There the great storm breaks, it delivers a single mighty lightning bolt that scorches through the heavy twilight air and plunges into the soft earth beneath. In that instant, it turns to solid Stormfrax, gleaming in the half-light. Honored is he who should witness such a sight. Vilnix's eyes gleamed greedily. Pure lightning, he thought. What power must each piece of Stormfrax contain? He looked up. And, um, what does it look like exactly? The professor's expression became dreamy. Of unsurpassed beauty, he said. A crystal that fizzes, that glows, that sparks. And yet is heavy, said Vilnix. Or so I learned. But how heavy? In the twilight of its creation, it is no heavier than sand. Yet in the absolute darkness of the treasury at the center of Sanctifrax, a thimbleful weighs more than a thousand ironwood trees, the professor told him. It provides the counterbalance to the buoyancy of the rock itself. Without it, the floating city would forever break its moorings and fly off into open sky. Vilnix scratched his head theatrically. What I don't understand is this, he said. If the crystals and shards are so heavy, then how is the Stormfrax brought through the darkness of the tunnels into the treasury in the first place? The Professor of Darkness surveyed the youth gravely. Perhaps, said the caterbird, interrupting his own story. Just for a moment he doubted the motives of the young apprentice, I'm not sure. Nor can I say what finally decided him to entrust Vilnix with the information. But entrust him he did. It was a decision which was to change the course of history in Sanctifrax. It is transported in a light box, he explained, with a light it emits calibrated to approximate twilight itself. Vilnix turned away in order to hide his glee. If a light box could be used to get the Stormfrax in... Surely, he reasoned, it could be used to get some out. Perhaps I could see some for myself, he suggested tentatively. Absolutely not, the Professor of Darkness barked, and Vilnix knew we had gone too far. None may set eyes upon Stormfrax, the Professor said. None save the Knight's Academic and the Guardian of the Treasury, who happens to be myself. It is blasphemy for unworthy eyes to feast upon the purity of Stormfrax, he ranted. An action, Vilnix, punishable by death. The caterbird paused dramatically.
At that moment, the wind abruptly changed. The floating rock of Sanctifrax drifted to the west and jerked violently as the winds went taut. I understand, said Vilnix humbly. Ah, Vilnix, the professor continued more gently. I wonder if you truly do understand. There are many out there who covet Stormfrax for themselves. Unscrupulous wind-touchers and traitorous cloud-watchers who would not think twice at observing, at touching. A violent shudder passed through his body. At experimenting on Stormfrax, if they thought it would serve their own ends. The caterbird fell silent for a moment before continuing with his tale. Early the following morning, it said, the treasury guard would have seen a gangly figure creep furtively across the corridor from the treasury, had he not been dozing at his post. There was a light box clutched in the intruder's bony hands. Inside the box was several fragments of Stormfrax. Twig gasped. Vilnix had stolen some. Vilnix scurried back to the apprentice's laboratory at the top of the rain tower. The caterbird continued. Triumphantly, he placed the box down in front of an eagerly waiting group of young rain tasters, and with a flourish opened the lid. The crystals of Stormfrax sparkled and flashed like nothing they'd ever seen before. Pure lightning, said Vilnix. If we can unleash and harness its energy, we'll be the most powerful academic Sanctifrax has ever known. Hour after hour, the rain tasters worked, yet no matter what they tried, be it dissolving, freezing, melting, or mixing the crystals with other substances, none discovered how to unlock the power of the Stormfrax. Outside the window, the sun went down. The light turned a golden orange. Suddenly overcome with frustration, Vilnix raised the pestle and brought it down hard, crushing the fragment in its fury. A moment later, he was overcome with remorse. He had destroyed the priceless Stormfrax. The caterbird's eyes narrowed. Or so he'd thought at first. When he looked more carefully, though, Vilnik saw the result of his actions. The crystals had turned to a sepia powder which moved in the bottom of the bowl like quicksilver. I don't know what it is, Vilnix told the others, but let's make some more. A second shard was taken. It was placed in a second mortar. A second pestle was raised. Outside, the light faded. Then, with the exception of Vilnix himself, who was busy pouring his own liquid dust into a jar. All the apprentices gathered round. The pestle was brought down and... BOOM! Twig started back in surprise. The power of lightning had been unleashed all right, the caterbird snorted. But with the direst of consequences, the explosion ripped through the tower, reducing half of it to smolder and rubble. It rocked Sanctifrax to its core and jarred the ancient anchor chain to the very edge of breaking. All the apprentices were killed in the blast. All that is, save one. Vilnex Pomponius, Twig whispered. Precisely, said the caterbird. There he lay, on the floor, barely alive, but still clutching the jar to his chest. The scent of almonds hung in the air. Dazed and confused, Vilnex stared down at the Stormfrax dust. What had gone wrong the second time, he wondered. What had happened? As he pulled himself up on his elbows... A drop of blood fell from a gush in his cheek and into the jar. The instant it made contact with the dust, the thick red blood turned to crystal clear water. The expression on the caterbird's face grew deadly serious. Crisis now hung over lofty Sanctifrax, it said solemnly. Thanks to the arrogant young rain taster's folly, the ancient chain was now perilously close to the breaking point. Worse still, the theft of the Stormfrax had left the treasury depleted. With the buoyancy of the rock increasing every day, and less to weight it down, the upward pressure on the rock became intolerable. There was just one glimmer of hope. The wind touchers and cloud watchers had confirmed that a great storm was indeed approaching. Accordingly, an inauguration ceremony was hurriedly arranged. Quintinius Virginix was to be knighted, and would set off to chase the great storm to the twilight woods in search of Stormfrax. Meanwhile, the caterbird continued, Vilnix lay in his sick bed, his mind working furiously. He might have failed to harness the power of the lightning, but he realized that the Stormfrax dust he'd created was itself miraculous. 
A single grain dropped into the foulest water instantly purified it. What would the inhabitants of filthy, fetid Undertown not give for his wonderful dust? Anything, he whispered greedily. Anything at all. Without waiting to be discharged, he left his hospital ward and returned to the dilapidated tower of the Rain Tasters. Or rather, Rain Taster, since he was the only one left. There he busied himself. Everything had to be ready for the next day. Finally, that day arrived. Everything had to be ready for the great day. And finally, that day arrived. The sun rose and shafts of light streamed in through the eastern arch of the Great Hall, where the Sanctifrax Council was already assembled. The professors of light and darkness, in white and black robes respectively, sat at the front of the hall behind a table, upon which were a sword and a chalice. Before them, seated in rows, were the academics of Sanctifrax. Every discipline was represented, the College of Cloud, the Academy of Wind, the Institute of Ice and Snow, the Air Sifters, the Mist Graders, the Fog Probers, and on crutches, the single remaining member of the Faculty of Rain Tasters. A tall, powerfully built young knight crossed the floor and knelt down in front of the Professor of Light. By the powers vested in me, O oh, thirst for knowledge, O oh, sharpness of wit, the Professor announced, raising first the chalice and then the sword. I offer up for your approval, Quintinius Virginix of the Knight's Academy. The Professor looked down at the kneeling figure. Do you, Quintinius Virginix, swear by all that is wise, that you will serve the order of the Knight's Academic with heart and mind, for swearing all loyalties other than to Sanctifrax? Quintinius trembled. I do, he said. Twig's heart swelled with pride. My father, he thought. And do you swear also that you will dedicate your life to the finding of Stormfrax, that you will chase the great storms, that— The professor breathed in deeply, slowly. That you will not return until and unless you have completed your sacred quest— the cater bird turned and fixed Twig with its unblinking gaze. His father, your grandfather, Wind Jackal, was a sky pirate captain. How furious Quintinius had been with him when the old fellow had offered him up for service at the Knight's Academy, for he had wanted to follow in his footsteps. And now, now, words could not describe how honored he felt at receiving the highest accolade that Sanctifrax could bestow. Quintinius, he heard the professor gently say, do you swear? Quintinius Virginix raised his head. I do, he said. The professor of light then leaned forward and handed the chalice to Quintinius. Drink, he said. Quintinius raised the chalice to his lips. The professor of light took up the sword and held it high above his head and waited for Quintinius to drain the chalice. And waited, and waited. But Quintinius remained motionless, unable to drink the thick, foul-smelling liquid. All at once there was a flurry of movement in the rows of benches. It was Vilnix, leaping up noisily onto his crutches and making his way to the front of the hall. The Professor of Darkness sat forwards uneasily in his throne. What was the young fool doing now, he wondered. He watched Vilnix raise one of his crutches and tap the chalice lightly. The good waters of the Edgewater River are no longer what they used to be. He chuckled and then turned to address the hall. So isn't it time we stopped fooling ourselves? All this nonsense about knights academic, about storm chasing, about sacred storm fracks. He sneered unpleasantly. When did a knight academic last return? Tell me that. What has happened to all the others? A murmur went round the hall. Garlinius Gernex, Lydius Ferex, Petronius Metrax. Where were they now? The murmuring increased. 
Seven years ago, the last night academic set sail, Vilnix went on. Screedius Tolinix, his name. It was eight years ago, someone cried out. Nearly nine, called another. Vilnix smiled slyly. He knew he'd got them. Nearly nine years, he announced, his voice echoing round the hall. He turned to Quintinius Virginix and pointed accusingly. And we're pinning all our hopes on him! He paused dramatically. Why should he succeed where others have so tragically failed? Just then the Great Hall lurched violently. Nine years! Vilnix cried out again. We need to do something now! The Hall lurched a second time. But what? Dust fell from the cracks in the ceilings. The answer is simple, my friends, Vilnix announced. We must build more chains. There was a gasp and the hall fell still. The plan was indeed simple. It was also outrageous. There had only ever been one chain, the anchor chain. A senior reader from the Faculty of Air Studies was the first to break the silence. The production of chains would mean more factories, more foundries, more forges, he said. The Edgewater River is already polluted. He nodded towards the chalice still clutched in Virginix's hands. We run the risk of making the water completely undrinkable. All eyes turned to Vilnix, who smiled benevolently. Then, making a mental note to reward the senior reader with a full professorship for his question, he hobbled back to Virginix and seized the chalice. With his free hand, he pulled a silver ball-shaped medallion from his gown and dipped it into the muddy liquid. Instantly, the water turned crystal clear. He returned the chalice to Virginix, who sipped. It's sweet, he said. Pure, clean. It's like the water from the deep wood springs. The Professor of Light grabbed the chalice and drank too. He looked up, eyes narrowed. How is this possible, he demanded. Vilnix returned the Professor's gaze impassively. It is possible because of an amazing discovery, he said. My amazing discovery. He tapped the medallion. Inside this pretty bauble is a substance so powerful that a single speck is enough to provide a person with drinking water for an entire year. He turned to the rows of incredulous academics. This star... He stopped himself. This substance, which I call... Frax dust, in honor of our beloved floating city, signifies a new beginning. Now we can ensure the future of Sanctifrax by building those chains we so badly need, safe in the knowledge that we will never go thirsty. A cheer resounded around the hall. Vilnix lowered his head modestly. When he looked up again, his eyes were blazing with the excitement of impending victory. My associates in the League of Free Merchants are merely awaiting the go-ahead to get started on the chains, he said. A smile flickered over his lips. Naturally, he said, they will deal only with the Most High Academe. The new Most High Academe, that is. He swung round and stared at the Professors of Light and Darkness. For what would you have this pair of buffoons? who, between them, have brought Sanctifrax to the very edge of destruction with their arcane rituals and pointless tradition? Or will you have someone who offers change, a fresh start, a new order? Cries of a fresh start and a new order began to echo around the Great Hall. It lurched again. And a new Most High Academe! Vilnix Pomponius, the soon-to-be professor of air studies proclaimed. The others took up the chant. Vilnix closed his eyes and bathed in their adulation as the chanting grew louder. Finally, he looked up. Let your will be done, he cried. I, your new most high academe of Sanctifrax, 
shall speak with the leaguesmen, and the chains will be built, and Sanctifrax, teetering on the brink of oblivion, will be saved. The caterbird looked sadly at Twig. One person alone remained unmoved, it said. One who, at the last possible moment, had seen everything he aspired to cruelly snatched away. Your father, Quintinius Virginix. His face hardened. There was something they would not take away. The sky ship that had been constructed especially for him. The Storm Chaser. He spat with disgust and strode across the floor. At the door he paused and turned. If I, Quintinius Virginix, cannot prove myself as a knight academic, then I shall prove myself as Cloud Wolf, the Sky Pirate, he bellowed. And I make you this promise, Vilnix Pomponius. You and your treacherous friends in the leagues will rue this day for as long as you shall live. And with that, he left. The caterbird shook its head sadly. Of course, nothing is ever that simple, it said. Despite your father's parting words, it was many moons before his defiant promise came true. His first ill-fated voyage almost saw the end of both him and his ship. Indeed, the only good that came out of it was his initial meeting with the stone pilot. He was forced to lay low, to store the storm chaser in a safe berth, and take up position on a league ship until he had gained sufficient money and inside information of the leagues to try again. Its eyes swiveled and narrowed. The league captain he ended up serving was the notorious Maltinius Gobtrax. It was upon his ship that I was born, said Twig thoughtfully. But what about Sanctifrax itself? The caterbird snorted. For all Vilnix's fine words of a fresh start in a new order, the situation rapidly worsened. Nowadays, as you know, the Undertowners labor like slaves in the foundries and forges, making chains and weights to support the anchor chain. They manage to keep Sanctifrax in place. But only just. It is a never-ending task. And all the while, the waters of the Edgewater River are becoming more and more polluted. It is only because of the particles of frax dust, supplied to the loyal leaguesmen by Vilnix Pomponius, that Underdown hasn't already choked to death on its own filth. Twig shook his head in dismay. And Vilnix? he asked. What does he get out of it all? Wealth and power. The caterbird replied simply. In return for drinkable water, the League shower Vilnix and his new faculty of rain tasters with everything they could possibly want and more. Just so long as the specks of Frax dust keep coming. But surely the situation cannot last forever, said Twig. When the Frax dust runs out, Vilnix Pomponius will have to take more storm Frax from the treasury. The caterbird nodded. That's precisely what he does do, he said, and the Professor of Darkness is powerless to stop him. What's more, the production of more frax dust has proved elusive. Despite a thousand attempts, many tragic, no one has been able to reproduce the results of that first experiment. But it's crazy, said Twig. The more storm frax that's taken from the treasury, the more chains they need to manufacture. The more chains that are manufactured, the worse the pollution of the water gets. And the worse the pollution of the water, the more frax dust they need to purify it. It's a vicious circle, said the caterbird. That's what it is. A terrible, vicious circle. And twenty years after that momentous meeting in the Great Hall, the situation is looking bleaker than ever for both Sanctifrax and Undertown. Wrapped up in their own concerns, both the rain tasters and leaguesmen remain blind to what it is going on around them. But if nothing is done, and done soon, then it's only a matter of time before everything falls apart. But what can be done, said Twig. The caterbird shrugged and turned its head. That is not for me to say. It swiveled a purple eye round towards him. Right, it said. My story is complete. Now, will you release me? Twig started guiltily. Of course, he said, and retrieved the knife from his sleeve. 
He began jiggling the narrow blade about in the padlock again. There was a soft click. The lock was undone. He unclasped the padlock and pulled the door open. Oi! came an angry cry. You said you were trustworthy! What an open sky do you think you're doing? Twig spun round and gasped with horror. It was flab sweat, back at last with the animal doctor and bearing down upon him like a madman. I can't, he heard the cater bird complaining. Help me, Twig. Twig looked back. The cater bird had managed to get its head and one wing out of the cage, but the door was small and its other wing was twisted back and jammed. Go back in and try again, Twig instructed. The cater bird did as it was told, folded its wings up and thrust its head back outside. Flab sweat was almost upon them, a heavy club swinging at its side. Twig reached up and with his hands round the creature's neck and shoulders pulled gently. Flab sweat raised the club. The cater bird pushed its legs hard against the perch. Come on, Twig urged it desperately. Almost there, the cater bird strained. I made it! It flapped its wings experimentally, once, twice, then launched itself off from the edge of the cage and soared up into the air, apparently none the worse for its confinement. It was time for Twig to make himself scarce, too. Without looking round, he turned on his heels and sped away into the thronging street. As he set off, the club glanced against his shoulder. A second earlier, and it would have smashed his skull. Faster and faster, Twig ran barging through the crowds, elbowing dawdlers out of his way. Behind him, Flab Sweat screamed with rage. Thief! Scoundrel! Never wicked! He roared. Catch him! Twig ducked into a narrow alley. The shouting grew fainter, but Twig kept going faster than ever, past pawnbrokers and tooth pullers, barbers and inns, round a corner, and slap bang into the arms of his father. Cloud Wolf shook him roughly by the shoulders. Twig, he bellowed. I've been looking everywhere. We're ready to set sail. What have you been up to? Nothing, Twig faltered, unable to return Cloud Wolf's furious gaze. High in the sky behind his father's head, Twig saw the cater bird flapping off into the setting sun, past Sanctifrax, out of Undertown and away. He sighed enviously. The cater bird might be gone, but its doom-laden words remained with him. A vicious circle, that's what it is. If nothing is done, then it is only a matter of time before everything falls apart. And for a second time, Twig found himself wondering, what can be done? <laughs>